All right, so we are at 10.33 and the, uh, the flow in has slowed down a little bit. I do expect that we'll get some more people, but let's go ahead and start this webinar. So I appreciate that all of you are here from all over the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us, uh, Clean Coders, and myself, Angela Brooks. I am the video editor for Uncle Bob, for uh, Paul Stringer here, for any of the artists that you see on the Clean Coders website. And this is my pleasure to be able to participate in this first Meet the Author. I introduce myself as Angela Brooks, and this is true. I am also, and a lot of people often wonder, I am the daughter of, well, you guys know him as Uncle Bob, but I know him as dad. And so I do a lot of the production, well, I do all of his production, and I've had the honor of producing Paul Stringer's videos. It's um, actually kind of cool because he, you, Paul, are the first author that I have not videoed. You mm -hmm. came on board uh, during this current COVID time. And originally, I think we had thought that maybe I would travel to you in the UK yeah. to do the video work, but you managed so successfully to do all of the camera work, lighting, and everything. Me and this, me and this iPhone were just about able to kind of cobble it together. It, it's amazing, <laughs> right? And so I had the um, I had the pleasure of receiving all of your video footage via Dropbox and then put it all together. And so that was exciting for me to see. It was a challenge for me, right? Because usually I'm in control of the camera and the lighting and I see what the topic is and I hear it out of order, uh, but that wasn't how it was with you. So we've had this very long distance communication and relationship working on your videos and it's been a complete pleasure. So I would like to formally introduce everybody to our newest author on the Clean Coders website as a clean coder, Paul Stringer. So I do Hi, have everyone. questions for you. <laughs> Thank you for the intro. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, it was very, it was uh, totally interesting working on this. Um, you know, as you said, we did plan on maybe you helping us with the videoing of this, and then it turned out that wasn't going to be possible. And so I took on the, as you said, the role of kind of doing all of it, which I have new respect for anybody who does this stuff, because you wouldn't believe the amount of work that goes into having to, you know, hold the, the amount of time I had to deal with, like the lights going out and trying to stage everything and, and get the audio right. And you know that we had a lot of stuff that didn't quite work technically. Sometimes we had to go back and do some things. So it was, it was quite a journey, but uh, one that was totally worth it. Totally. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of kind of what we put together and, and, and the wonders that you worked on the material that you had to work with, because uh, in places, it, it, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, like, it, it's very hard for me to judge it, but uh, it looks like it turned out okay. I, I think it turned out great. So I'm curious, what, um, tell me a little bit about your background, and then what, tell me about acceptance testing, I mean, I saw all the videos, uh, but I'm not a developer. So tell me what they are all about. <laughs> okay. All right. So a little bit of background. So how did I get into this whole business? I mean, we go, we, we don't want to go back too far back in time. And, uh, otherwise we'd be back in the eighties with all this gear up here. That's like my first ever home computer, the, the, the Lisa up there. Um, my, my dad also was in the business. Um, so I kind of, uh, you know, was born and, and grew up with this stuff. I, I grew in an Apple kind of computer family. So that kind of, is in the genes there. Um, and so I ended up in the software industry uh, in the in the kind of late 90s, uh, then through the 2000s onwards, uh, saw, saw the kind of emergence of the internet and over time have kind of moved with the industry in, in the various different directions that it's gone in. Uh, for the last 12, 13 years, I've been a, uh, very much focused in, in the mobile uh, engineering space as many of us have been with the, with the growth of that. Um, so I'm an iOS engineer now by trade. That's what I do. It's what I've been doing for 10 years or so. Um, and as many of us uh, kind of at the Church of Clean Coder, uh, we, we all go on this journey where we we sort of start out. We're not particularly, not all of us are professionally trained in this stuff. I did no computer science degrees. I don't have any of that kind of like actual uh, uh, sort of uh, academic foundation in this stuff. It was all just trial and error. And as I talked about the videos, uh, uh, coding by coincidence and just typing things until the right thing happened. Um, 
And then that gets you so far and then you realize that kind of there must be a better way to do this because it doesn't feel, you know, you feel like that fraud who's running around typing things in and assuming that you're getting paid for it, but you're not really completely sure that you know what actually what you're doing. So um, a good friend of mine introduced me to, to uh, Uncle Bob's books. And uh, for many of us, that's maybe how we got into this. And I, I've got them all up here on the rack behind me. This one here, I got signed by him. So I, I became a bit of a fan followed the material, looked at the videos, uh, loved what the videos did. And, and through that, got into this acceptance testing thing, which is something that I hadn't actually, didn't know anything about in all the years in software engineering, I'd never heard of this idea. Um, and then when I was kind of introduced to it through, through, uh, through your father's work and, and other people too, it just struck me as one of these things, which I was, you know, you very rarely come across me genuinely new um, an idea and this to me was like how have i not heard about this this seems so obvious and such a powerful idea why aren't we all doing it um and so uh, and particularly for me working in in mobile uh we went through that transition when it was a very early nascent technology and then kind of it was all new there was no existing legacy code to work with so we kind of seemed to be doing very well and then suddenly it all kind of came crashing down and we realized that there had to be a better way to doing this stuff. And uh, one, of the, one of the biggest problems that I've encountered as a, an engineer in, in more of our software teams is the amount of over-reliance that we end up with on manual testing of, of the things themselves. And then we go from that into automated uh, uh, testing, which is typically computers pressing buttons on the phone screen. And, and again, that seems like it should work, but it tends in many cases in my own experience uh, over 10 years of this stuff to never really work out quite like how you, you expect it to. And so this acceptance testing idea um, seemed to really kind of get to the, to the heart of that problem and seemed to be like a solution to it. And it kind of blew my mind that it, it's been there, it's written about in all the books, it's been there for 10, 12 years, but so few of us seem to come across it or actually see it applied in the work we're doing. So to me, it's one of these things which if we could actually um, figure out how to, to apply it in our day to day, we might actually have a really good chance of improving uh, uh, the work we're doing and making it a little less, uh, I'm not going to say less painful, but uh, you know what I mean? Like uh, we, could, we, could, we could certainly make it better, I think. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's uh, broadly how I came to this. It's one of those ideas that just seems so obvious yet so powerful. I was just like, I need to know more about this. So I went on a bit of a journey to learn more about it. That's really interesting. And and what a great journey it, sound, it sounds like to me. Well, what brought you to become an author for Clean Coders? Because that, that's fascinating to me too. I always wonder how well, the developers get involved. It's been a pr prolonged gestation, I'll, I'll tell you that. So I think the first conversation was, your father was in town in London. He came, he used to come over quite often. I'm sure you remember. And he was giving one of his talks and, and because of this acceptance testing thing, uh, there was this tool that he'd written uh, a number of years ago called Fitness, which some of you may know about in the audience. And it's an acceptance testing framework. It's really good uh, and I'd been using it. And to make it work with mobile, I built a, a little kind of extension to it, which allowed you to test iPhone applications with it. So I wanted to show it to him. So when he was in town, I grabbed him and I said, you know, uh, I've written this thing. I think it's pretty cool. Can I show you it? So he sat down and he gave me some of his time and, and I showed it to him and, 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 and he seemed quite interested in it um, and said, you should make a video series about this thing. And I was like, really? Okay. And then that was kind of uh, where we left it. And I emailed and we bounced a few emails backwards and forwards, but uh, I just had a young daughter that this was going back five years ago. And I just, it seemed like a lot of work to me. And um, I, I, I wasn't quite you know, <laughs> in a place to be able to commit to doing it. So we put it on hold. And then about two years ago, I think I emailed you back, Tad, and said, you know, that idea we had for doing this, this video course, I, I, I think, I think I'm ready. I think I'd like to do it. And then uh, we got back in touch and, and then we went through the early process of, of, of how you put one of these things together. Did you watch that how to make a clean coders video by chance? I from did. Like 10 years ago? Yeah, I did. I did. Was that um, helpful? That was the first thing I was told to, to watch. The idea of sitting down and scripting the thing first was a bit of a sort of like, really? Like, you know, I imagine the, the way you see the videos, it's just you, you, you put a camera up and, and people just sit down and start you know, talking about that thing, but but no, it's all very 
that this scripting process is very important to uh, being able to kind of make it all come together at the end, I think. So, but yeah, it was uh, really useful. And obviously the top tip in that was uh, get a green screen. Um, and, and I did, and it turned out to be a lifesaver because I tried initially to do some of these things on location. And I've learned that on location stuff is really hard to do uh, with, with outdoor wind Noise. and water stuff and holding the lighting. Apart. So the green screen came in really useful, uh, yeah. as I'm sure you'll know. Uh, oh, it good. It's a, there's a learning curve with that green screen, but it worked out really well. You did a great job with it. So what were some of your favorite parts and, and some of the f favorite bits of creating your script and creating these videos? I do have a favorite bit, but I'll get to that, uh, the story of that in a second. Um, the, the, the whole process of coming up with it is quite interesting. You kind of, um, I, I'm, because I'm such a fan of kind of the, the, the clean coders videos as, as they are, I knew I wanted to do it kind of in the style of a clean coder video. So I knew it, you know, to sit and watch one of these things for an hour um, seems, seems like a big commitment from people. And, 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 you know, you've got to at least try and entertain as you go. So um, scripting helps with that because you, you are able to think it through and kind of, you know, uh, bring, bring the different characters together. It takes a while to get, get that uh to to feel right and who the characters are and we went through a different number of iterations and and the characters we ended up with are different to the ones i kind of imagined at the start and where they were going to be and things so there's an evolution there but it, that was really good fun and then you get into you kind of get into their heads a bit more and then you realize oh yeah and so you kind of just uh, the scripting was a really fun bit uh the bit i probably didn't like at all was the actual filming of it <laughs> I, used to, I used to dread the filming of it. It just seemed like it was just such, it was just, you know, you, you see, a, you, you, you've got a, a list of 300 scenes because when you break it all down and it's all that quick scene stuff, it's yeah. like, you, it, it feels like a lot and it's, and it's, you've got to set it up and you've got to get the house quiet. And I remember one day doing it in this room and I, I was ready to go, had everything set up, spent an hour getting everything just right. And then as soon as I was about to go, the, uh, the 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 guy next door started uh, uh, cutting his his hedge, and, and 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 it was just really loud. And I couldn't do it. it. It was just one of those moments, like oh god, this is too it's so hard. <laughs> to get yeah, because you get yourself all psyched up, like all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get through it all, and then yeah. something yeah. something prohibited. My dad and I have gone through that in the past yeah. too, and it's something so simple, like yeah, like trimming hedges. But it ruins everything, and it just takes you out of your mood. <laughs> and, and, and you people, push through. I'm sure people will be able to tell, but I ended up auto queuing this. Uh, so I hope I haven't given away my secret too much. But um, initially, I tried to just ad lib it out, so I knew roughly what I was going to be saying. But then I would just try and memorize it and then say it, and it took so long to get it right. And there was like 20 takes for one scene, which just when you're filming hundreds of them, just uh, as, uh, it, it was it was never gonna happen basically that way. So I invested in a small auto queue, which I've got over here, which is you basically, I don't know if you could tell, I'm sure you could, I was reading all this stuff, but you pop your one phone in there, it's got your oh. um, auto queue, and then you put your other phone in the back, pop that on a tripod, and then that helped a lot with the kind oh. of velocity of getting this thing done. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I did not notice that. I mean, maybe there was one scene where I'm like, I wonder how he's remembering all this, but working with my dad so much, you know, you're you're the author, so you know what you want to say. This is your your niche. Yeah. But I didn't notice that. So kudos. Well, I, I probably shouldn't have <laughs> said that. And then No, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Stop, cut the tape, rewind. Get that well, out. Is, uh, get behind the get behind the scenes. So you know we'll reveal all the, all the trade secrets here. Uh, yeah. This. Well, speaking of scenes, how did you come up with some of the characters? Because there's um <laughs> there's some interesting characters in your video. Some of them are kind of different versions of me. I think there's kind of me in some of all of them. There's a younger version of me, kind of completely just you know. Uh, way too chill i don't know like just as a younger version of me there's a probably a version of me now but he doesn't look quite like what i look like now he's kind of a slightly grumpier older guy um but he's probably me right now in, in the way I, I i sort of kind of view <laughs> view software and all the rest of it and uh we've got another couple of characters who aren't me at all but I, they were just fun to do so we've got a because this is all about the collaboration between business and engineers and and all that good communication that needs to happen 
Um, we have a, a business guy who I know is a bit of a favorite of everybody's. Um, he's he's a kind of um, he's based on sort of a a typical like London Cockney geezer, if that's a, a phrase everybody's familiar with. And he's he's he was kind of my idea of a sort of slightly sleazy business guy. He hangs around. He, he's probably the kind of guy who would sell you a, car, a used car uh, that you would probably want to return to him, but then you wouldn't be able to find him. He's that kind of guy. Um, and obviously that you don't really come across those types of people in this business but it just seemed like a funny thing that we would have somebody like that kind of basically running the operation uh that, that we end up kind of in the series we basically go through the process of building a piece of software uh together as a kind of team and he's part of that team as we try and elicit the requirements uh, from him and he's all a bit vague and ambiguous uh, a lot of the time, and we have to kind of tease out from him, what exactly do you want us to do? <laughs> so this is all about how we figure that out. You would throw in some like little one-offs in once in a while in your videos. Like you, you would say, all right, I want this Snow White whistle while you work during this scene. What inspired that? <laughs> I'm oh. really curious. Oh yeah, so we do have a few little movie clips dropped in. I don't know quite what the, the situation is with the rights and usage of that is. I presume it's all fair use, but a little Snow White in one of the episodes which comes through and it's, be, and it's I can't quite sure what inspired that. I was looking for, <laughs> I was talking about the happy path and the unhappy path. And I can't remember what, what, what I had this idea that I was gonna be in a storm and it would be the unhappy path and it was like terrible. And then I just, uh, I, I think you just go on YouTube and just start looking for stuff. And I was like thinking, oh, uh, this is, I remember the scene vividly watching with my daughter when Snow White goes into the woods and it all starts off quite nice. And then it all goes really dark and, and terrifying as they do in Disney movies. And I remember the kind of the trees coming in and the lightning. And I felt like that's like, like that's the unhappy path. That's like when the software is just going all wrong and, and you're trying to figure out, you know, worrying about this and that and so found a clip and 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 uh, i was like yeah that that's it it was perfect i was like that's exactly what what i imagined the the unhappy path to be and then of course you got the happy path which is all the seven dwarfs just happily merrily going along uh, doing their business and uh, and uh, that was it just seemed like fun to throw those in every now and again well i have a question for our participants uh, maybe you've seen this scene, maybe you haven't, but just based on what Paul is describing, the the code just surrounding you and becoming dark, by a show of hands, I'm curious how many of you have experienced that. Uh, a lot of people are raising their <laughs> hands. So I think that's completely relatable. Now, the fact that it was Whistle While You Work and then Snow White, yeah. I, I think that's yeah. just well, funny. the Whistle you While know, You Work, that's like the start of the project. It's like, that's <laughs> It's going really well. Like a, a green field. Yeah. This is awesome. Yay. <laughs> I thought that was really clever. And and things like that in your videos, I really enjoyed throwing those in there. You had um there was another clip where you wanted to, you had this white wig and a white beard, and it was kind of godlike in a way. Yes. And and so I um edited it to have music and some glowing effects, and it was it was fun. So you made it challenging for me. And that's what I really enjoy challenging in a very fun and creative way. And, and I appreciated that as the editor, but it also really strikes a curiosity for me as to where you or many of the authors, where these ideas come from. And maybe it's just as you explained it, you're thinking about it and it's dark and, and it comes just comes naturally, it sounds like. Yeah, so they, they are they're just kind of flashes of inspiration. You're kind of going through it and you're like, I don't really know what to do with this. I, I remember I really struggled with those like happy path and unhappy path things because I was, I knew that I was sort of, I might be in it, but I wasn't really sure what the background was going to be. And I was really struggling to find that, to composite that to be interesting. It just felt very flat and boring. Um, and, and so, you know, we don't want flat and boring. And then it was like, ah, and then I just, I was like, uh, get that suddenly it worked and, and you're like, ah, oh, I don't know where that came from. But there are lots of things we tried which didn't work as well, I, I do remember. So, you know. Uh, have... Not that many things. It, it flowed pretty well. Frankenstein, that was another one that was. Oh, funny. yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed putting those clips in. Uh, we put some old movie clips in from Frankenstein, which to me, Frankenstein is kind of the automation. You, so if you imagine you've got your software and then you used to have people, human beings actually testing the software out and then you try and get a machine to do it. To me, that is like 
Dr. Frankenstein in his lab trying to automate this this monster, and you end up literally with a monster crashing about the 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 the, the lab and you know d doing terrible things because monsters don't well machines don't like operating in a in a human world uh, and when we design things for humans and then ask machines to try and operate them it kind of doesn't end well it never has i've never seen it end that well and to me that was another perfect analogy for um you know <laughs> just just uh two worlds just coming together which just they just can't figure it out um and, and frankenstein to me stumbling through the world just not understanding it was it was was perfect. You had created a whole time span of you communicating on your computer with many of your characters. So it was a virtual meeting on the computer. And uh, it was that was another challenging thing for me to put that together where on the computer screen, each of your characters is there and getting the timing to get that conversation to work. I think it worked out really well and it showcased the conversations that developers and business managers and, and all parts of the teams have when working on a project. So that was a lot of fun for me. I'd love it if you would just, I mean, obviously you've experienced this before, which is why you came up with it, right? So tell us well, just felt, a little bit about that. It, given, the, given the times that we're living in, it did feel like we had to get Zoom in there somehow. You know, this. <laughs> this is how things are being done these days. And so it was like, I, it, it seemed like, how would these guys all get together and 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 figure this out? And it's, they're probably gonna end up on a Zoom call. The, the most fun bit I had with that was that the, the, obviously the engineers come together and, and then we have, we have Dave, our business guy, our analyst guy, and he's sitting on a beach in, 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 in somewhere very nice and sunny, but obviously it's all a, a virtual background and we don't actually know where he was. Um, but it, it was fun. It was, it was um, uh, yeah, I think that was probably a tricky one to edit to make it feel like um, there was an actual real conversation going on and maybe, you know, but it, yeah, it was good. And I think it was just that idea of let's bring Zoom in because this is how we're, we're, we're doing stuff. So hopefully everybody will be able to kind of relate with that experience, I'm sure. It's, just, it's uh, reality, yeah. it's reality. Wow, well, it was certainly a, a lot of fun for me to be able to do this and the back and forth with the editing. Um, it, if it, none of you have ever edited videos before, it's, uh, it's a very fun, and creative way to spend my time anyway. But you guys as developers get to spend your time ruling the world. <laughs> so that's that's pretty great. Um, Tad, tell us, or, or Paul, tell us where people can find out more about the videos and acceptance testing and Paul, if, if you don't mind. Oh, sure, uh, I'd be happy to. And my favorite character before I, I, I get to that, I, I second where I do like the businessman, but I also like Krusty. Krusty seems oh, Krusty. to have a lot of wisdom there. Krusty and, and Dave. And, yeah. As I talk with Paul and even occasionally some of uh, Paul's background members there and his, his sets, um, they also, I think, like Krusty, probably the best. And, and probably yeah. my, my second favorite would be the... Um, uh, I, I see him as really the the wisdom of of uh, of Paul series, which is the the pyramid gentleman. Uh, he's an explorer. So we talk a lot about the testing pyramid, and it, and it just again it it struck me as um, if we're going to the pyramids, it would be some old time thing where we just discovered you know this mysterious magical thing and. We use it as a way to talk about the testing pyramid. So I'm glad you liked them. I think he's called Howard. I'm not sure. I think he's called Howard though. Howard Howard did a, a great job walking us through your series, uh, or you did as Howard. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how you do with the uh, the different personalities. It was Howard. Howard. Different Howard. personalities. You nailed it. It so, like so multiple Howard, personalities come out. <laughs> As, as Howard walked us through that, he did a, a, a smashing job in doing that. Um, to answer your question, Angela, when it comes to where to find all series on acceptance testing, you can just go to cleancoders.com right there on the homepage. You can look at the library or you can go down and you can follow the links from 
uh, Paul as an author, and you can read about Paul as an author, and go directly over to his series. So there's many ways to get there. It's just a matter of how, but probably the easiest way to do in the beginning is to sign up with an account, whether that's a personal or a business, and then uh, follow the road to whatever series is interesting to you, but all will be there. Great. Paul, we do have a couple of questions in the Q&A chat. I will go ahead and read these to you. And uh, if you'll take a couple of minutes to answer them, that'd be great. So right. Salvatore asks, do your videos describe acceptance testing techniques on specific platforms such as web, desktop, or mobile? We do it specifically with a mobile application. And that's just what I know. So we used it to develop a mobile application. It turns out we build a calculator. Uh, an old an old HP 35 calculator, which we uh, drive out through the, uh, the through this, the, the specifications that we write in terms of the acceptance tests. Um, I think that the tool that we use for this is fitness. Uh, again, that's the, the one I happen to know. There are others, but it just for this purposes, it was it was perfect for what we wanted to do. And fitness itself lends itself to any platform you can think of. Um, in terms of being able to do this. So you could use it for web services, um, web browsers, uh, whatever. The, the main thing is, is that we use it to, to talk to the code uh, at a layer beneath the user interface. So uh, using the various different plugins that are off of fitness, you can kind of connect it up to, to any piece of software. And the reason I chose mobile and iOS particularly, because if you think of all the platforms out there, the, the most closed technologically, um, it's, it's iOS and uh, and 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 iPhones um, and Xcode, which are all kind of all completely proprietary compared to kind of, you know, everything else that we use in the rest of the industry. So I figured that if we could show that it worked with that, uh, that then we uh, everybody would feel confident that it would work with everything else out there. Um, so that was why I kind of went with that one. Scott um, asks you to tell them a little bit more about what acceptance testing is specifically. Okay, so if we take the testing pyramid, which hopefully everybody's familiar with, but but very quickly, the testing pyramid describes an agile approach to testing your software such that there's not an over-reliance on manual testing or automated testing at the UI level. So obviously we all know about the good old unit tests at the, at the bottom, there's a big old chunk of that. And then at the top, you've got the kind of a smaller uh, amount of, of manual or automated UI testing, which tests the entire system end to end. And then there's this big piece in the middle and everybody kind of skips over that. Everyone's like, well, the bit in the middle, the integration, the component, uh, we, we're, not, we're not so clear about that because it's not immediately obvious uh, which technology we should use for that, who writes these tests, where they should be. So acceptance tests are really the tests that sit in the middle um, of the testing pyramid. So they're one layer above in complexity than unit tests, uh, but a layer beneath all the UI. And the most important critical thing to take away from this, even if you don't watch the videos, is that they are the only tests that test the software from the perspective of the business and the customer, not from the perspective of us, the developers. So the, the, the reason why that's so important is that it's so easy often to build things from the perspective of a developer, um, where we make various assumptions about what the code should do, because we need to tell the computer absolutely everything about what it needs to do. And therefore, sometimes we end up filling in the, the, the blanks when we don't have it from our from our uh, from the requirements. And there is where we get into a bit of a muddle because sometimes those assumptions are incorrect. So acceptance tests are the things which guide the actual behavior of the software because they're written out front first, just like uh, uh, unit tests are if you're doing test driven development. And they test the software and describe the software from the perspective of the requirements of the customer or the business. So that is in hopefully a bit of a nutshell what acceptance tests are. So, you know, we get into it in more detail, but- Very uh, detailed, yeah. Yeah, with, yeah. With great examples too, because you actually run through uh, code with the calculator and, and describe yeah. it very thoroughly. Which was a great example because that calculator itself, it, it, it's an unusual one. It, it, it operated a little bit differently to the calculators we're used to today. So for me in actually doing it, I was learning stuff all the time about how this calculator worked because I've never actually used one. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it was, it was great to be the developer and also the person having to kind of understand what this thing actually needed to do and how to be an authentic kind of emulation of what that original uh, Hewlett-Packard calculator uh, did, which was, 
for those who know it, it, it was the HP 35 was the very first pocket calculator, which, uh, which kind of, it was almost like the iPhone of its day, I think. Um, I wasn't quite around for it, but apparently it was a big deal. Um, so Kevin asks, did you give characters real names or something like business guy? Business guy's <laughs> name changes several times if anybody's watching these videos closely enough. He starts off as Richard uh, and then ends up being <laughs> Dave. Dave. Um, uh, so there's a little bit of a continuity problem there, but uh, hopefully uh, it doesn't affect your enjoyment of the series. Um, and yeah, they all have names. So uh, we have Ben, the developer, Krusty, the old uh, grumpy guy, uh, who's basically me. Um, <laughs> we have uh, Dave, our, our business uh, 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 chap. Um, and uh, we have Howard, who we've just named, I think, during this <laughs> call. I think Howard just came from, the, he was the one that really didn't have a name. And um, have I missed anybody? Is that all of them? There's a designer who makes the uh, a few little. I mean, that that's Dave there, isn't it? Uh, yep, that's in, Dave. He's just Dave about to go into a, some kind of uh, jazz club somewhere. I think uh, we just caught him on the way. Yes, yeah. So somebody had asked to see a little bit. Now this is going to be a little challenging because I did not prepare any of these videos to share on the screen, but I have them here up on my editing computer. So let's just let's play this guy because he's a little cheeky. Yeah, don't say we don't invest in our teams and quality. It's a big initiative from the top. We funded a huge effort for the QA team to automate all the manual testing. The boss is very excited to see the cost reduction once we've got it all up and running. Hang on, that'll be him. You've got it up and running, right? I love it. He's like so yeah. smug. He's so, so smug. Um, Ruslan asks, where is the entry point of acceptance, acceptance tests in clean architecture? Is it adapt, uh, adapter layers, may use case IO ports, or maybe use case IO ports, or we compile the whole app iOS and test it through UI interactions. Uh, great question. Um, and, and we get into this in the final episode where we talk about architecture. So clean architecture, one of the, 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 the mistakes I made, and I went through this pain myself, was when I uh, first tried to introduce acceptance testing uh, uh, using fitness into a project, um, I, I, we didn't have a particularly well thought through architecture. And was, we didn't have what you would see as a clean architecture um, in, the, in the project. And it made our life hell. It made it really hard to make these things reliable and, and kind of easy to work with. So the entry point with a, with a clean architecture would be communicating directly to your use cases, that they are your business logic, and that's what we're most interested in testing. So what you would do is you, you, you compile just the use cases, if that's the, the, the pattern you were using, um, and then we build around them these very uh, lightweight objects called fixtures, and the fixtures just basically translate the input uh, into calls into your use cases. They get the output back out, and they, they then we uh, confirm whether the use cases are doing what they're meant to be doing. Um, and just like in TDD or unit testing, we are removing all the uh, extraneous details from around the business logic layer itself. So there's no databases, there's no network calls, none of those things. We're talking directly to, to the business layer because that's the only thing we need to test really when we want to uh, understand the, the the behavior of the software from the point of view of what it actually does. And then there are other tests in the pyramid which test those other things. So your UI tests, which you'll have some of, but hopefully not too many um, if we're following that pyramid, um, they're going to test the kind of the, the more of the, uh, the thing as a whole. So does the UI work? Does the UI talk to the use cases? Is it connected up to, to, to the network, et cetera? Azimat, I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Uh, he, he or she asks, are there examples of network interactions, co-currency in the series? Short answer, no. Uh, no, we don't get into that. Again, the, uh, the idea would be to remove the complexities of network and concurrency from what you're trying to test, because what, not, what, what we are not trying to test with these acceptance tests is the network or how we're handling concurrency. We are focused on isolating just the business logic layer and, and getting that into a sort of test harness in a way which it's easy to kind of uh, stand it up, 
pass it messages and get messages back out. Now, um, concurrency is a hard thing. So, so, so the best thing we want to do in these tests world is to kind of remove that if we possibly can. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we don't get into that as such, because hopefully with, with an architecture, hopefully that supports this, you can remove those things as concerns. Um, and test those things somewhere else. Uh, now, I know that's not always kind of possible or straightforward to do, but uh, that would be the general principle that we'd be trying to follow if we could. Jorn asks, what is the hardest thing to get right with acceptance tests? And what is the most common thing people get wrong? So the hardest thing to get right, I think that the, there is a real art yeah. to yeah. distilling um, business requirements into unambiguous statements of of uh what i what are called truth tables basically everything starts from a kind of you know a requirement and that requirement will normally be written in some kind of or communicated in in english language and we'll discuss it and debate it but then at some point you've got to take that and, and distill it down to what it's eventually going to be which is some kind of input and some kind of output and and the art and trick to this comes down to really figuring out how to how to articulate that um in in just th that kind of manner and and it takes a bit of work but the but really this is almost like the kind of the the real benefit of doing it by doing that you're forced to think about it because at some point you're going to have to figure that out um, and normally we do that when we're typing at the keyboard trying to write the code and we're still doing that process but what this does is it brings forward that process to a point where you're doing it when you're not committing yourself to actual software and code, but but still to the point where you're trying to refine and think about what this software actually does. Uh, so you're, you're bringing forward the almost the analysis and analytical work that you need to be able to then write the software. And I find that then writing the software actually becomes much easier because you've done the work, you've kind of broken the work up into different pieces. Um, so that's a really tough bit because that is really the work um, is figuring out what the software actually does. Uh, and how to kind of break it down into the simple instructions that we end up uh, manipulating data and transforming data and sending inputs and outputs. But these force you to do that. And then the most common mistake I think that people make with acceptance tests and things of its type um, is what we've talked about, testing too much of the system, so testing through the user interface. Um, so the mistake that I made, and I know this happens quite often, is you end up writing tests that try to exercise the business logic of your application through something that wasn't really designed to do that through the user interface. And therefore, you've got an awful lot of complexity around that user interface. And you often can't get uh, close enough to the code itself to be able to make these uh, simple enough that, that, that they don't become an absolute nightmare to maintain. So uh, that's the that's the common pitfall is that these become so complex because that we haven't been able to isolate the part of the system that we're most interested in. Um, they become very complex and then they, they, they become unreliable and they become hard to maintain and eventually everybody gives up and we just go back to doing what we do, which is manual testing. So I'd, I'd say they're the two key things. John asks, do you demonstrate how to use fitness with iOS? Yes, we do. Uh, oh. So that's exactly, that's exactly how we do it. We, uh, we spin up fitness out now. So I don't get into details about how that actually works uh, because it, 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 we stay more about the kind of the general principles. So it's accessible to everybody. We don't want to spend a series telling people about iOS if, and, and fitness if that's not their thing. Um, but I do, there are, the, there's material out there on, on the web about how to do this. I'm actually the maintainer of the, of, the, of the glue, if you like, between fitness and iOS. So there's a GitHub repository of a thing called OC Slim Project, uh, which is a very un, unappetizing name, but, for, but <laughs> it, it's the thing that kind of helps you communicate and set up an iOS project such that fitness can integrate with it. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, kind of all out there on, in the repo. So uh, if, if you're interested in that, I, I'd send you towards that to have a look at that. And uh, you can get in touch if you have any questions about how, how to do some of that, happy to help. There are quite a few more questions, but as I was reading through them, I believe that all of these questions are answered in your video series. There's really some great questions there. And if you wanna scan through them, open your Q and A, uh, Paul, and you can scan through them. But I do believe that all of your questions here will be answered 
in the series. And out of respect for everybody's time, we are going to end this, uh, this meet the author currently. If you have these questions still after you've watched the video series, then please jump on the, the blog, send an email to Tad, myself, or to Paul, preferably to Paul, I'm sure he can help you, um, and uh, join in the conversation. I know that we have a lot of various places that you can converse with the authors and uh, clean coders on, on the clean coders website. So in your emails coming up following this uh, slight a short, excuse me, webinar, you will get a discount code for videos on the Clean Web, clean Coders website. Wow, I'm fumbling with my tongue now. Thank you to everybody who has participated with us today. We really appreciate you spending your time with us and being here. This has been recorded, so if you loved it and found it very valuable, please share it with your friends, other developers that you think would benefit from learning about Paul and why they should watch the accept, accepts to, uh, say it for me. Accept thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Again, thank you everyone for being here, Tad and Paul. Um, let's, uh, let's chat a little bit more after this is over. Okay, bye everyone, thank you. Thank you bye, so everybody. much everybody, bye bye.